Here are some impossible sounding scientific achievements that could happen in the future. Number seven, become a mutant. Yep, that's right, you heard me. Thanks to scientists, we could become like a few of your favorite X-Men in the future. Now, when I say we could become mutants, I don't mean we're going to turn into angry wolverines, although that would be pretty cool and useful in certain situations. What I'm specifically talking about is telekinesis, which is the ability to move things with our minds. Pretty crazy, right? Well, it's actually really not. Scientists at the Minnesota College of Science and Engineering have come up with a non-invasive technique known as electroencephalography, which manipulates brain waves, which in turn allowed its students to control the motion of a helicopter. Let that sink in for a minute. Standing in front of the helicopter, these crazy kids were able to manipulate its movement simply by imagining that they were moving their hands either to the left or to the right. How exactly did the kids do that? It apparently takes a lot of work just to manipulate our brains in that way. The subjects underwent a training period of approximately three months and had to undergo a series of tests to get them used to the nuances of mental manipulation. However, having said that, if this actually works past the current subjects, the potential is enormous. The scientists are hoping to expand this technology for people that suffer from paralysis or neurodegeneration. Number six. Man and machine as one. With an estimated 285 million people worldwide with eye problems that's rendering them with partial or total blindness, the new Argus 2 sounds like a dream. It works by using a camera built into sunglasses and then wirelessly transmitting whatever the image is into implants or microchips, which are implanted in people's retinas. It provides information at such a fast rate that the optic nerve is then able to recognize movement, basically any light and shapes in front of them, but only in black and white. Though it's been available in Europe for the past few years, the FDA only approved it in 2016, so we've got a while before it's readily available to the public. But beyond healing blindness, imagine the other possibilities it could lead to. For example, who's to say that we won't be able to record what we see in front of us? or give our military super eyesight with information not even at their fingertips, but right in front of their eye. Or, for all you gamers out there, the chance to play in pretty much the closest it could get to a real-life video game. It'd be like augmented reality, but on steroids. Well, with all of these advances, scientists will possibly be able to eventually bypass the eye and just send messages directly to our brain. And like that, we'll be able to zoom in and zoom out farther than our mere human eyes can currently do. Furthermore, if these new implants can detect the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which apparently they can, or will be able to soon, then who's to say that we won't be able to gain infrared vision or heat sensing capabilities? Basically, it's a whole new meaning to spyware and we're just getting started. Elon Musk wants to do that too. Musk just launched a new company called Neuralink that plans on developing implants which will be put in our brains so that we can survive a Terminator-type apocalypse. But anyways, by creating these implants and by linking our brains to computers, he's hoping that we will continue to outsmart computers instead of becoming literal slaves to the machine. Okay, okay, before we get too carried away, Musk hasn't actually commented on whether this is why he created Neuralink or not. I'm just using my imagination here. What we do know is that doctors have already used implants to try and treat conditions such as epilepsy and Parkinson's disease. Musk wants to take it a step further and actually use artificial intelligence so that we can push our brain's limits to a whole new level. Number five, fat that burns, fat. Recently, scientists at John Hopkins University discovered that they could transform bad fat cells into good ones, and when I say good ones, I mean ones that burn calories and keep us skinny. By knocking down the expression of a protein in rats' brains known to stimulate eating, Johns Hopkins researchers say they not only reduce the animal's calorie intake and weight, but also transform their fat into a type that burns off more energy. This ability to turn bad fat into good fat that burns calories instead of storing them could add a serious new tool to tackle the obesity epidemic in the United States. More than two-thirds of adults in the United States are overweight and more than one-third are obese, according to government estimates. 
The Johns Hopkins study, published in the Journal of Cell Metabolism, looks at two types of fat made by the body, white and brown adipose tissue. White fat is the typical fat that ends up around your stomach and other troublesome places and is the storehouse for the extra calories we eat. White fat cells have a single large droplet of lipid, one of fat's building blocks, such as cholesterol and triglycerides. Cells in brown fat, considered a good fat for its energy burning qualities, contain many little droplets of lipid, each with its own power source, which enables heat generation. Babies have ample stores of brown fat at birth as a defense against the cold, but it mostly disappears as adults have very little of this calorie burning tissue. Crazy, right? Alright, we're gonna have to slow our roll again. Just because the researchers successfully managed to genetically reprogram the pinky and the brains, well, brains, it doesn't mean they're able to do it for us right now. They were able to reduce the rat's calorie intake and weight and also managed to transform some of the bad white fat into brown fat, which is the best type of fat that burns extra calories away. They're still ages away before it's going to be available to humans. Bummer. I could use some neuro lipo right now. Number four, live in space. Does living in space actually sound appealing? I guess being weightless would be a novelty for a while, but come on, working out would be super tough. Anyways, it's just been announced that a new skyscraper is set to be suspended from an orbiting asteroid above the Earth. Anyways, a New York architecture firm is planning on building a skyscraper in space, 50,000 kilometers to be exact above the Earth. Awesome view of Earth, and I bet at that point it's not going to matter whether you're afraid of heights or not because that's way, way up. The tower, which will be named Analemma Tower, will move in a figure eight between the northern and southern hemispheres daily so its residents can see and visit major cities such as New York or Dubai on a daily basis. Just to give you a reference, satellites in low Earth orbits are normally military reconnaissance satellites that are 160 kilometers above the Earth. These satellites orbit the Earth very quickly. One complete orbit normally takes 90 minutes. How this building is able to do figure eights is beyond me, but I'll let them other guys figure that out. The massive building will also be set up in very specific sections, each with a specific purpose and design. The section will be split, for example, into sleeping quarters, dining, worship, and entertainment. It'll also be solar powered and water will be collected from cloud condensation and rainwater which in turn will be purified for use. You know what? Sign me up! Well, okay. We just went from 0 to 100 real quick, so let's uh, slow it down for a bit. This is from the team that's also pitching proposals for a Mars house and a cloud city, and look how those are going. Not so good at the moment. But, you know what? If I had a bet on it, this will certainly be a reality in the future. Things are still in the planning phases to say the least, and by planning, I mean the plans don't actually reveal how people would enter or exit the building, although one illustration showed people parachuting from the tower to the ground. Yeah, it looks like they need a little more time to think this one through. Even the director of MIT's Sensible City Lab, Carlo Ratti, calls it a fun project, but of course noted that the logistics would be a nightmare. Basically, it's a great dream, but one that's not quite there yet. But hey, we gotta dream big, right? Number three, 500 pound shredded humans. Over the past century, bodybuilders keep getting bigger and bigger. At his peak, Arnold Schwarzenegger was 235 pounds of pure muscle, and he still was smaller than Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who stands in at a crazy 260 pounds. And although he's not a bodybuilder ripped, he still has 10% body fat. Additionally, retired bodybuilder Ronnie Coleman started training in 1989 and was around 215 pounds, but by the early 2000s, he was competing at 297 pounds. Basically, he gained 82 pounds of pure muscle in less than 15 years. Okay, let's admit, he didn't do that uh, au naturel. That can't be healthy, so what's next? Well, with all these statistics showing us that these guys are getting larger and larger each year, when are we going to see 500 pound bodybuilders? Well, it certainly looks like we're going to get to that point one day. Myostatin related muscle hypertrophy is a rare genetic condition characterized by reduced body fat and increased skeletal muscle size. Affected individuals have up to twice the usual amount of muscle mass in their bodies. 
They also tend to have increased muscle strength. Myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy is not known to cause many medical problems, and affected individuals are intellectually normal. The prevalence of this condition is unknown. Mutations in the MSTN gene is what causes this condition. I mean, uh, hold up, can I actually intentionally get this condition? The MSTN gene provides instructions for making a protein called myostatin, which is active in skeletal muscles used for movement. This protein normally restrains muscle growth, ensuring that muscles don't grow too large. Mutations that reduce the production of functional myostatin lead to an overgrowth of muscle tissue. Myostatin-related muscle hypertrophy has a pattern of inheritance known as incomplete autosomal dominance. People with a mutation in both copies of the MSTN gene in each cell have significantly increased muscle mass and strength. People with a mutation in one copy of the MSTN gene in each cell also have increased muscle bulk, but to a lesser degree. Researchers at Guangzhou Institutes of Biomedicine and Health in China have edited the genome of beagles to create double the amount of muscle. Could humans be not too far off from the future? As steroids get better and better, we're seeing bigger and bigger bodybuilders. At what point will the human body say no mas and not be able to do all the extra skeletal muscle? We'll find out one day. Number two, Mars colonization. For this century, we're journeying back to space. Elon Musk and NASA think they found the ideal landing site for their 2020 Mars mission. SpaceX announced recently that it has been working closely with NASA to find the best spot to land their unmanned capsule. And it looks like it's paid off. The researchers have now narrowed down four potential landing spots on the red planet's northern hemisphere. Now, what makes an ideal landing location? Well. According to the researchers, they want to be close enough to ice so they can examine Mars's potential water source while also having access to lots of solar power. The area also needs to be flat and easy for the capsule to move around, so rocky terrain is a no-go. I guess the rover isn't much of a hiker. Apparently, we can get a capsule to Mars, but it can't move over some rocks. I'd call it lazy, but let's face it, it's doing enough work for us in our potential new home on Mars, so I guess I can't complain. Because, let's get real, if they really find a dream landing site for this mission, then that means we're getting closer to building a colony on Mars, and how cool would it be if you could have a home on Mars? Instead of going to the Jersey Shore for the weekend, you just hop on over to Mars. Well, that's what Elon Musk is hoping anyway, because as of now, he's hoping to create a self-sustaining colony on our neighboring planet within the next 100 years. Crazy. Number one, resurrecting Lazarus. And at number one, here's my pick for the most ridiculous scientific achievement that actually could be a reality. He's alive! This one looks at how we may all become Dr. Frankenstein's monsters in the future, thanks to new science and technology. Was Frankenstein a forewarning for what was actually to come? Do you think we could actually bring people back to life? And more importantly, do you actually want to? Well, before we get into that deep existential question, let's be clear. We're getting closer than you think. In 2015, researchers proved for the first time ever that cryogenically suspended worms, that means frozen worms for anyone that didn't get that, retained certain memories after being defrosted. So what does that mean for us? Well, if all goes to plan, it means that we could hypothetically come back to life after death. All scientists have to do is freeze our bodies in liquid nitrogen and then basically wake us up later. Memories, personality, etc. All of it remains. However, in human tissue, each freeze-thaw process causes significant damage. Understanding and minimizing this damage is one of the aims of cryobiology. At the cellular level, these damages are still poorly understood, but can be controlled. Each innovation in the field relies on two aspects, improving preservation during freezing and advancing recovery after thawing. During freezing, damage can be avoided by carefully modulating temperatures and by relying on various types of cryoprotectants. One of the main objectives is to inhibit ice formation, which can destroy cells and tissues by displacing and rupturing them. For that reason, a smooth transition to a glassy stage or vitrification by rapid cooling rather than freezing is the aim. 
Obviously, this achievement is still far from happening, and there are still way too many obstacles to overcome that probably deserves its own video. However, it's definitely not as far-fetched as we think. Theoretically, with this technology, coupled with advancement in stem cell therapy, does this mean that one day, certain people will have the option to live forever? Someday, we're going to find out. Here's what's next. Before Viagra was launched in 1998, men had very few ways to combat erectile dysfunction. They either had to get an injection or get a prosthetic implant, neither of which sounded too pleasant. Viagra was originally known as UK92480, 